up next, we have David Josephson uh, discussing graphing Nagios. David is uh, the engineer and evangelist at uh, Librato and author of the book, Nagios Building Enterprise Grade Monitoring Infrastructures for Systems and Networks. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to give a round of applause, David Josephson. No, that's very well done. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, so these first few slides are going to be redundant. Uh, I am Dave Josephson, <laughs> the uh, developer evangelist at Librato. And I'm here today uh, to talk to you about some of the tools, techniques, and patterns involved in pushing time series data from Nagios into some of the um, visualization systems that are commonly employed by many of the top tier web operations and um, telemetry teams in the world today. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm not feeling super great right now. <laughs> so this is a talk about tools. Um, it's a talk about how to get data out of Nagios and into those tools, and uh, sometimes vice versa. It's actually the second time that I've given this exact same talk at, at Nagios World. And uh, putting the slides together this time around, I was sort of blown away by how different uh, this talk is than it was last time. Um, Building and maintaining uh, really efficient and effective time series databases is a difficult problem, um, and sometimes it's counterintuitively difficult, uh, and especially at scale. Uh, there are a lot of moving parts. Um, there are a lot of confusing storage and scaling intricacies involved. Um, so the last time I did this talk, I, I wrapped it in a series of anecdotes about the operations teams that tended to choose the tools uh, that made up the various tool chains. And because there were only a handful of possible tool chains to choose from, uh, most of which that began with Nagios and ended in RRD tool, uh, with very few exceptions. But um, so we fast forward to today, and now there's like this explosion. There's hundreds of metrics tools out there uh, that can be combined in thousands of different ways. And there's just no way that I'm going to be able to talk about um, the people anymore. Um, so instead, I'm, I'm probably going to try to talk about uh, some of the design patterns that we commonly use to build uh, metrics processing and visualization systems in the wild in sort of an abstract way. Uh, and this should allow me to sort of roughly categorize these tools uh, into a few different groups. Um, and these groups are, are absolutely my invention. <laughs> these tools have a way of uh, sort of, you know, defying any attempt to categorize them um, to a, a greater or lesser extent. Um, this, I have a lot of ground to cover this morning, so this really is just going to be sort of an introductory talk. We're, we're going to talk about uh, what these tools are, how they basically work, um, how you get data out of Nagios and into them. I'm not going to go very in-depth, and I'm also not going to talk about why you might want to do any of this. I'm going to assume that you just want to graph things, um, and then I'm going to talk about how to do that. Uh, later on today at 4.30, um, I have another talk which is a little bit more philosophical. It's about why you would want to design a metrics collection system um, that embraces metrics as a first-class citizen and how to sort of integrate those tools with Nagios. So I'll jump right in uh, with the first pattern. This pattern should be very familiar to everyone in the room. <laughs> it's the centralized polling pattern. Uh, and all of these patterns begin with a thing that we care about or like a series of things that we care about. And in the centralized polling pattern, uh, the, the general assumption is that these things are servers or processes that are running on servers. Um, and what we do is we designate another computer to poll the things that we care about. So every so often, um, this centralized poller wakes up um, and it starts checking in on the various computers that we care about until it comes across a problem. Like maybe there's this host that's, that's not responding anymore. And then our monitoring computer um, notifies someone like a network administrator who takes decisive action to correct the problem. Um, and I said this should be familiar because, of course, this is the pattern that Nagios employs by design. <clears throat> Nagios basically is an implementation of the centralized polling pattern. It forks off uh, plugins, or I guess it doesn't fork anymore, does it? It's doing whatever it does um, to pull the things that we care about using a series of plugins that are written in various languages, but mostly Perl. Um, as you're probably aware, the output from those plugins carries more than just state data. Um, sometimes our plugins return something that looks like this with some freeform text followed by a pipe, followed by some really unfriendly looking stuff. 
And it turns out this, this stuff uh, after the pipe is performance data. So not only do many of Nagios plugins return this, they, they do so in a standardized format um, as a series of key value pairs separated by semicolons, optionally suffixed by units of measure. And we can take that performance data out of Nagios by performing, or by, uh, excuse me, by defining a performance data handler in the Nagios CFG. Um, so we can extract those performance data metrics uh, and then we can insert them into other tools that can graph them for us. Um, PNP for Nagios is absolutely the most popular performance data handler out there. Uh, so this tool chain that we're looking at right now is, and has been for many, many years, sort of the gold standard for metrics processing uh, in Nagios. Uh, it's, it's very common, it's very stable, it does a very good job of transforming traditional output, like state output from, from plugins like Check ICMP into what is essentially a visualization of uh, network latency from the point of view of the, net, of the Nagios system. Um, so this is, it's very well tested. Probably all of you in the room, or 80% of you, or, or whatever. I, by the way, I don't, I don't do the whole, show me your hand if you're doing that. I think that speakers who do that are bad people, and they should feel bad about themselves. Uh, so I'm going to assume that yes, 83% of you um, are doing this now, um, which is a safe assumption. Um, the polling pattern as well is sort of very well tested. It actually predates most of the, of the visualization and metrics processing systems that, that, are, that we have in use today. Uh, but as you, you probably also know, um, it's not without its problems. Uh, the first real engineering problem here is that the central polar limits my data resolution. My data resolution is by definition equal to my polling interval. So um, when I see data on my graph uh, from a, that's submitted from a Nagios box, um, I'm usually going to see it on the order of minutes. Uh, so anything that sort of, any sort of trouble that persists less than one minute um, or usually sometimes even five minutes or seven minutes, depending on your Nagios configuration, I'm basically just not going to see represented on the graph. The, the second problem is the centralized polar um, limits the number of things that I can monitor. Um, when we get Nagios core into the realm of hundreds of thousands of services, we usually have to start either getting bigger iron or using passive checks and or um, sort of distributing the, the check worker load um, to additional monitoring systems, which may be fine with you or not, depending on um, your circumstances. But this second pattern, um, the autonomous agents pattern, um, basically solves the resolution problem. It was developed very specifically to get higher resolution data from the things that we care about. And like the name implies, instead of polling the thing we care about every so often, we're going to inject an autonomous agent inside it. Um, and this agent is going to wake up every so often we aren't going to con try to blah. we aren't going to attempt to control his actions or his schedule. Um, we're going to make clones of him. We're going to put him all you know across all the things that we care about, and we'll let him just collect and blast metrics data to a central collector as often as they want. They usually wake up on the order of about 10 to 15 seconds, and we get much higher resolution data um, without you know stressing the the centralized polar because the polar doesn't actually have to ask for any of the state. It's just constantly getting it. This is also nice. Um, not only can we get data on the order of seconds, but we can point our pull or we can point our agents to multiple upstream data collectors. So we can have one say for alerting and another for visualization, um, which is a, a, a pretty big win. So we can offload offload visualization to a second system, and not waste cycles on the Nagios box having to extract, excuse me, and uh, modify RRD tool files, which is good. Um, two really popular tools in this space are CollectD and CheckMK. Uh, both of them have excellent support for both Nagios and RRD tool, uh, and they provide, or can provide, very high resolution data um, if you configure them to. Um, the problem with the autonomous agent pattern in general is that it's still difficult to scale into the hundreds of thousands of hosts. It does help us because we get passive checks, uh, depending on your configuration. Um, but it's still not exactly the answer to scaling. Um, so the HPC guys uh, came up with this third up pattern, um, which is the roll-up pattern. The roll-up pattern combines um, the centralized or the the centralized polar with autonomous agents, pretty much. Um, we're still using an autonomous agent on each one of our nodes, 
but instead of configuring each of those nodes to blast to the centralized polar, we're going to configure them so that they are peers in a cluster group, and then we're going to let we're going to configure them to emit their metrics to a multicast address that they all share. Um, so when you do this, every node in the cluster knows the state of every other node in the cluster. Um, it's it's quite efficient. You can use um, various data structures to sort of model the state of the whole peer group. And then you only have to pull one peer in the peer group to get a state dump from the entire sort of set. Um, if one of those nodes goes down, uh, you can just move right on to the next node. Um, it doesn't matter which node you query. Every single node in this peer group is going to give you the same answer, uh, more or less, eventual consistency. Uh, this scales very well because a substantial amount of the monitoring burden gets sort of spread across um, the hosts. And uh, importantly, every host that you add to a roll-up system increases your ability to aggregate, summarize, and collect uh, metrics data. So instead of new nodes being a problem, new nodes literally become the solution. You can also have uh, peer groups that are configured to emit to other peer groups, and you can have polars that are configured to emit to other polars, or polars that pull other polars, I should say. So um, Ganglia is probably the purest implementation of the roll-up pattern in the wild. Um, it consists of an agent called GMOND, which is a fantastic agent, and I'm not just saying that because I have commits in it. Um, it's lightweight, it's easy to configure, um, does a brilliant job of cluster formation and multicasting. Once you wrap your head around it, um, it's probably my personal favorite collection agent out there. Um, GMetaD pulls data from the various GMOND agents it's configured for um, and either forwards it along or persists it in RRD tool. GMetaD is also cool because it has a socket interface. Um, so other tools can literally interact with the GMetaD box as long as they're able to talk to a TCP socket which is very nice. Um, so there are, for example, Nagios checks in the, in the contrib directory of Ganglia that will allow you to point a Nagios check, or point a Nagios box at a GMetaD, uh, query data out of GMetaD's socket interface, and then compare right, the, the returned values to expected thresholds. And that's very nice. Um, it also ships with uh, GWeb, which is a pretty awesome uh, RRD tool interface. It's, it's, it's also very stable. Ganglia has been around on the order of, God, seven, eight years now. Um, and it's, it's a very scalable means to replace a lot of computationally intensive check logic from the Nagios box with a single check that just goes against GMetaD and grabs a whole bunch of data and compares it. Um, and you get graphs for free. Um, but the roll-up pattern is... Uh, <laughs> It's technically superior in every way, <laughs> uh, but it's very difficult to understand. Um, and it's also kind of difficult to run in the wild. The multicast uh, forces you to cooperate with uh, network engineers, and it's just sort of hard to wrap your head around what could be going wrong when stuff goes wrong with it. Um, even the most complicated dual Nagios host setup or multi Nagios host setup is, is arguably easier to reason about. And so we don't see the pattern much outside of the HPC world. So, how are we doing so far? I'm feeling much better. <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, before we talk about the fourth pattern, uh, I need to talk a little bit about an assumption that we're making about uh, this thing that we care about which is a fundamental assumption that I think has been shaping our understanding of what monitoring tools look like, how they should act, and how they should operate for years and years. Um, and namely, this assumption is that this thing we care about is a server. And I think um, when we're building scalable uh, metrics processing systems, uh, this is an assumption that hurts us. It's, it's increasingly important for us to understand that this isn't necessarily the case anymore. And I'll show you what I'm talking about. Oh, that looks actually pretty good. I was sort of expecting that to wash out on the projector. Um, here is a graph, it's a real graph um, from my uh, production engineering stuff uh, of the 95th percentile amount of time that it takes a group of worker threads to fetch data from a Cassandra ring. Uh, so the blue lines you see in the middle basically represent uh, a breakout of the individual average times that these workers are using to, to fetch. 
Uh, the red line on top, well, I'll get to the red line in a second. The, the green line on the bottom represents basically the minimum um, amount of time. Uh, yellow line in the middle is an average across all workers, right, for every interval. Uh, and the red line at the top is basically the point of um, this whole second part of my ramble. <laughs> um, that red line um, represents the service-wide 95th percentile latency for this particular service. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm, I'll talk about it more, um, but it's a very important line. Because um, the thing that we care about has subtly changed here. Um, instead of the thing we care about being a server, the thing is now a thread. Um, we care about worker threads. And these particular threads, well, no threads have names, but these particular threads are running along with dozens or hundreds of other threads on ephemeral cloud instances that also don't have meaningful names because they were created by an auto-scaling group 30 minutes ago to meet an end-of-day utilization spike. And as soon as all of these office workers leave 10 minutes early to beat the rush home, those cloud instances go away along with these trolls, right? Um, so this, this thing, it's, it's hard. Um, it, it's ephemeral and very short-lived. It only exists as a bit of dynamically allocated memory inside its parent process. So I literally have to be inside the parent process of this thread to, be, to, to even be able to know it exists. So if we're trying to pull this thing, <laughs> not only will it be gone by the time we try to pull it, um, not only will the instance be gone probably after we've pulled it two or three times, but I literally don't have a means of externally pulling this thing that I care about um, from anywhere but inside the process itself. So in web operations, worker threads have really important things to tell us. Um, the, the, like I said, the red line at the top of this graph is composed of the largest measurement from each thread in every interval. And I'm going to put this on a white screen, get rid of the min and the average, and I thought this would help you see it better, but that's like even worse. Um, and then I'm going to zoom in so you can really see what I'm talking about here. So I'll use my laser. Ooh. Okay. So you can see like individual work, you see that these are individual workers, you see that like this blue line on top is actually drawn across the highest point regardless of worker thread identity in each interval. So that means um, that this red line shows the maximum I.O. latency for a service that might be running across thousands of hosts, thousands of threads on hundreds of hosts in different geographic regions of the country. It's a really common thing to want to know when you're running web operations, especially web operations at scale. So this fourth pattern that I want to talk to you about is called the emitter reporter pattern. And in emitter reporter, um, monitoring literally becomes part of our source code. Um, just like aeronautics engineers, when they undertake to build a thing, they engineer into the thing they build a means of you know, returning a reliable telemetry stream to the operator. When we build a thing with the emitter reporter pattern, um, we actually insert monitoring code into the thing that we build. When we write a function, and it's an important function, obviously it's named after me, it's important. Um, we want to be sure that it <laughs> never takes longer than like X microseconds to execute. We literally wrap it um, in a timer that's going to emit a number every once in a while to a metrics collection thread. If we are inside a request handler and we want to know what sorts of requests we're getting and how many of each type, um, et cetera, we're going to actually instrument our code with counters to emit counter metrics out to a metrics thread. So this is instrumentation. It's not debugging. This code is intended to stay inside of my production application for the life of the application. This is monitoring, OK? So ideally, what we want to do here um, is with the help of some kind of instrumentation library, the specific choice of which will depend on what language we're actually programming in, we want to emit metrics straight out of the inside of the thing that we care about into a metrics collection system like RRD tool. Um, but, <laughs> but it turns out RRD tool is actually really ill-suited for this kind of monitoring as well. Um, it, it's actually impossible to use with the emitter reporter collect, uh, the pattern. One problem is 
we need to know a lot of stuff to create an RRD tool database. Um, we have to know the polling interval, the X files factor. We have to have all of these obscure data storage and summarization intricacies figured out so that we can, as an RRD tool client, um, instantiate a new RRD. Um, and if we were doing this thing uh, every time we wanted to send a new metric, we would basically be doing it every time we woke up a thread inside um, the thing that we care about, which is kind of infeasible. Another problem is um, our data in uh, emitter reporter is often aperiodic. It doesn't arrive on a set schedule. It arrives whenever one of our customers pushes a button that maps to a function that emits a metric. So our RD tool is going to no-op a non-trivial amount of our data just because it arrived outside of the confines of, of when it was expected. Another big problem is where is our RD tool even going to store this data? Um, I'm on an ephemeral cloud instance that doesn't have a hard drive. Uh, we, we basically don't have right, a stable um, substrate right, underneath this thing that we care about to actually persist metrics to in a, in a you know, traditional sense. right? So ideally what we actually need here is a service. We need something that runs outside of and separate from the things that we care about. Um, we need it to be a service that we can just sort of chuck metrics at. Um, something that just caches what we throw at it, um, catches, excuse me, what we throw at it, as long as it's properly formatted, doesn't force us to compute storage intricacies on, on the client side for every new metric that we want. Ideally, even more ideally, we should be able to throw metrics at this thing regardless of their source. Um, I should be able to throw metrics from instrumentation libraries, log syncs, Nagios, custom scripts, whatever. Um, I don't know ahead of time what sort of metrics I might want to correlate on graphs later. So the safest bet is to just have a generic service that I can throw everything at regardless of resolution time, size, etc. And that uh, is the notion behind uh, this new set of sort of source agnostic metrics visualization systems. Um, the, the general idea is these are a thing. Um, you bring them up, you throw metrics at them, they catch them and give you the data back uh, in a <laughs> more or less beautiful form. <laughs> um, so of the fourth of these that I'm going to talk about today, three of them, uh, Graphite Influx and OpenTSDB, are all open source, um, and Librato is a commercial software as a service product that is obviously superior to all of them in every way. <laughs> well, <it's> <laughs> so um, before I begin dissecting them, um, I do want to mention the tool that you probably want to emit Nagios performance data into them. So there's one tool uh, between Nagios and all of these uh, that can bridge this for you, and that tool is called Graphios. It's an open source project that um, I'm not ashamed to admit I'm, I'm very proud of. I've spent the last several months uh, working with its creator, Sean Sterling. Um, it was originally a middleware library exactly like PNP for Nagios, except it was designed to connect Nagios to Graphite. Um, and Sean and I have spent the last several months sort of ripping the carbon code out of it and replacing it with a uh, modular framework of, of back-end plugins. So now, uh, Graphios, as of right now today, uh, I don't think the commit is in, but there is a back-end merge, um, help me, Git branch, that you can check out. Um, I have it running on my laptop. It works great. If you're interested, talk to me after. I think in the next couple weeks, uh, you'll be able to just go ahead and pip install Graphios, um, and it'll just work for you. And I'll, I'll, I'll be actually demoing this uh, in my talk later. So uh, let's talk about Graphite. Um, Graphite is by far the most popular tool in this space. Uh, it's composed of three pieces. It has a listener called Carbon. Uh, it has a data persistence tool called Whisper. And it has a web interface, which is called, confusingly, Graphite. So uh, Carbon's job is to listen on a network socket for inbound metrics. When you throw a metric at it from the thing that you care about, um, it's a very easy text-based protocol. Um, it's three space-separated values. So it's the name of the thing you care about, uh, which up here I have as thing.cpu.load. Um, it is the actual measurement from the thing that you care about. And it is an epoch timestamp, um, literally separated by spaces, chucked into the socket 
that uh, Carbon listens on, and it will graph it for you. Um, so you can literally do this with Netcat from Shell. Uh, you can do it from any number of tools that are designed to do it for you. Very, very simple. Um, when Carbon catches your metric, it will persist it for just a little bit, a user-defined amount of time, caches it basically, and then dumps all of the collected measurements for that interval into Whisper. Uh, Whisper then creates a ring buffer data store for it. Um, so you can think of Whisper as sort of a wrapper for RRD tool. Really, it's a re-implementation of RRD tool in Python. Um, it creates exactly the same sort of data store that RRD tool creates. It usually creates one per metric, uh, per source. So you'll literally wind up with, by default, uh, a directory that's like, you know, I think it's by default opt graphite, uh, whisper, storage, and then, uh, you know, the, um, all of the, yeah, individual files that contain the data from the things you care about. Um, the main functional difference between Whisper and RRD tool is that Whisper is able to um, apply a set of regular expression-based storage policies to the metrics that you send at it. So when Whisper literally gets a new metric that it's never seen before, it can compare the name of that metric to a list of regular expressions. And whichever one matches first, it will take that storage policy and apply it to this metric and then automatically create um, the database for you. So this is very nice because we don't have to think about storage intricacies much um, to begin with. We have that initial uh, graphite install. We think about the things we want to send it. We set up a default policy that probably works pretty well for everything. Um, and then, yeah, you just start checking metrics at it and you get graphs. The ring buffer storage is, is still difficult to scale to multiple entities uh, or nodes, whatever. Um, so Whisper helps us out there in a few different ways. It um, provides a set of, well, basically rsync scripts um, to help you move and, and synchronize the data storage between nodes. It also allows you to swap out the ring buffer storage entirely with a whole bunch of different sort of backend data storage systems, including things like Cassandra that are actually scalable. You can use them. Um, Another nice thing is you can use them simultaneously. So it's, it's theoretically possible today to build a graphite system that is emitting to both a scalable Cassandra ring and a ring buffer storage locally just in case. Graphite's front end is very functional, um, but some people find it a little hard to use. Um, I personally like it OK. Uh, you have a bunch of, you have a hierarchy of graphs over here, or a hierarchy of metric names over here. Um, you add them to the graph. You can save the graph into dashboards. Um, it's, it's, it's very resty, um, by which I mean it's once you understand uh, what it's trying to achieve, you can craft URLs that give you back graphs very easily. But there are a lot of replacement UIs because people find the built-in interface a little hokey. Uh, Tassio is one I like very much. Um, Tassio has a very good data to pixel ratio. Uh, it's uh, compatible with not only Graphite, but also Librato, Influx, and CloudWatch. Um, but by far the most popular replacement UI <laughs> is a tool you may have heard of called Grafana. Grafana supports all of the tools that I'm talking about today. So you can use Grafana as a replacement UI. Sorry for 10. We're going to have to talk a little bit more quickly now. Um, you can use Grafana as a uh, replacement UI for all of the tools I'm talking about except Librato because Librato's interface is obviously flawless in every way. Um, so I can demo this on my laptop for you if you want to catch me in the hallway and you want to play with uh, Grafana. There's also a, a live demo at play.grafana.org. So Graphite's an awesome tool, uh, but like everything else, it has its problems. And before I bring up the next slide, I'll just mention that the guy who wrote Graphite and in the primary product project maintainer works with me at Librato. He's like, we're cool, so I can harsh on it a little bit. <laughs> the main thing that I find difficult about Graphite is that um, there's just too many pieces. Uh, there's no one way that you can run it. Um, there's so many replacement parts, so many scaling intricacies, so many tools to choose between um, that it's hard to get right the first time. Um, it also somehow always winds up re requiring like more care and feeding uh, than you expect it to. But that's probably true of, of any sort of open source time series database 
that you try to run yourself, you really have to have somebody on staff or, or you know, a few people on staff to give it love. So um, too many pieces is not a problem InfluxDB has. InfluxDB is a single monolithic Go program. Um, it listens on three different ports, HTTP POST, JSON UDP. It also supports the carbon protocol that we were talking about with graphite. Influx DB, the, the DB suffix um, is not hyperbole. <laughs> uh, it takes a very database centric view of time series data storage in general. Um, so if you like databases and you like messing with databases, then Influx is, is right up your alley. Uh, it implements a slew of user configurable storage engines on the back, level DB, rock, hyper. Um, and it requires sort of database-y decisions from you like shard spaces, um, and et cetera. It even has like very MySQL-like admin interfaces um, and a wonderful SQL-like query language that, that's optimized for dealing with time series storage data. So um, you can do operations like sorting, merging, joining, deleting across multiple time series. It's, it's very nice um, once you sort of get in there and, and start working with it. Uh, it, it also includes a built-in Explorer UI, um, which is, it's solid, um, but it's not probably what you want to use. It's, I mean, it's good for data exploration, mainly, not necessarily for like showing metrics to your managers. Uh, but like I said, Grafana uh, can definitely be pointed at Influx and become um, sort of the system of record. So okay, uh, I have one last digression that we need to talk about before I get into TSDB. So, um, and this is about how time series data gets stored. Um, I apologize. <laughs> so this is a data point. Uh, it's a single measure from the thing that we care about. Uh, if I make one of these per second and I store them all for a year, it takes up about 250 megs on space, assuming it's a float. Um, if I measure 100 things on my server, this increases to 25 gigs. If I measure 100 things on 100 servers, we're looking at about two and a half terabytes. Um, and that's not the end of the world. Like we can buy individual disks today that will persist, you know, two and a half terabytes uh, and larger. But when you reach a data volume of that size, um, processing it becomes sort of a non-trivial task. And I'll show you what I mean by that. When we need to graph something, um, basically the, the engineering problem is to take a user-specified chunk of time um, input and find the correct chunk in this entire data series and then take that chunk into a graphing library and draw it. Um, and we have to do this usually on about the order of 100 milliseconds for the, for the interface, for the experience to not suck. Um, so when you're doing this, when you're parsing terabytes of data on the order of milliseconds and then doing something useful, um, this borders on a big data problem. Um, and it, when we're at like shops like Google and Amazon, when we have a big data problem, we use things like MapReduce to solve them. Um, but most of the time series databases that I'm talking about don't obviously implement MapReduce internally. Um, they use what we call a consolidation or summarization function to avoid making this a big data problem. So this is RD tools, this is Whisper, this is you know, everything that we've talked about up until now. Um, they all have this concept of a summarization period or a summarization function. So, um, so let's say these measurements are 10 seconds apart. Um, that there are 12 of them, which makes this a uh, two minute long um, time series. With a consolidation function, what we do is we take and compute a new data point um, basically at a decreased resolution by averaging together the high resolution data. So we keep the raw stuff around for about 24 hours and then we actually persist long term these two new data points that summarize the period. Um, and this works really well for, for just about all of us. Um, it, it lets us inside of, of time series sy systems um, avoid making this a big data problem at the cost of like some decreased resolution uh, for data that's older than about 24 hours or so. OpenTSDB does not do this. Um, it deals with raw data only, has no built-in consolidation, always shows you raw data, um, just as you input it at whatever resolution you input it. So how does it do this? How does it, it avoid making this a big data problem without using the con consolidation function? And the answer is it doesn't. <laughs> uh, it actually embraces this as a big data problem. Um, so OpenTSDB is basically a implementation of MapReduce on top of Hadoop and HBase for metrics data. <laughs> Uh, and so you send, you send uh, your data into it, um, your data goes into the map layer, gets persisted, and then all of the graphing um, 
searching for data and sort of snapping off data and sending it to other processing systems all become MapReduce problems. And that probably sounds either really cool or completely ridiculous to you, depending on how data science -y you are. Um, I will say that if the data science aspects of it don't win you over, the UI is unlikely to. Um, <laughs> but as I've mentioned, Grafana works here too. So no biggie. And now I have a few minutes, hopefully, to talk to you about you know, the one that you're actually going to eventually use, which is Vibrato. <laughs> um, so it'll probably be a relief to you uh, if any of what we've talked about seems complicated and annoying. Uh, Librato really is very simple. It's a REST API. Uh, you pretty much can emit metrics to any from anything that can HTTP post, uh, curl wget. There are shell libraries. There are libraries in every language that you're likely to use. Um, the shortest path, like I said, is, is Graphios. Um, you basically plug in your Librato credentials, you specify a whitelist in the, in the Graphios configs because this does, this, we do charge you for what you store, so you want to be kind of careful about what you send. Um, with a one minute polling interval uh, in Nagios, Librato is about 10 cents per month. As you'd expect, it's a commercial product, so it's, it's a lot more polished. You don't have to work as hard, you get a lot more. Um, you basically chuck uh, some metrics at us along with some money, <laughs> uh, and you get back. Uh, you know, very usable, very nicely crafted dashboards, correlation tools, things like alert processing, so you can detect uh, threshold violations and then execute web hooks that shoot passive checks back into Nagios or into other things like pager duties and et cetera. Um, I'll just say that, uh, like I said before, uh, most of the stuff I've shown, I've shown you is running on this laptop and I will be demoing um, some more of it uh, this afternoon. I plan to show sort of the tool chain from uh, Nagios into Graphite, into Grafana, and then pulling, and then using Nagios to actually pull Graphite to get some stats back. And at this point, uh, I will welcome, <laughs> welcome any questions you might have. <laughs> any questions for uh, David here? Questions, comments? I've got one, I guess, if, if no one else does. Do you have anything uh, upcoming that you're excited about uh, for the future here? Any uh, upcoming projects, anything like that? Uh, I am working on a whole lot of stuff. Um, we have, uh, well, in the Librato UI, we have a, a, a Spaces um, UI re-architecture, which is, is much nicer um, in, in many, many different ways. Um, it allows you to, I could demo that for you too, actually, if you're interested, but um, it, uh, it's sort of a reinvention of our UI um, that is easier to work with, easier to see, solves a lot of the sort of annoying problems that people have had with you know, um, our already perfect interface, admittedly. Uh, I'm also, yeah, working Graphios. Uh, I'm working several things in the HECA project. Anybody know what HECA is? You guys familiar with HECA? Um, HECA is very interesting. It's a, it's a top-level metrics processing library. Um, so you can imagine Imagine you have Nagios in your shop, someone else has Zabbix in theirs. Um, you can both sort of emit state data and performance data up to this layer, um, which is what HECA is. And HECA can tee off the data um, to other metrics processors. It can filter the data for certain types of events. It can correlate things. It can do a lot of really smart stuff. It's, it, it comes out of Mozilla. Um, they're a very log-centric shop. And so HECA is also it's also kind of a utilitarian loggy tool, uh, but it, it manages to be also a lot more than that. So. Uh, so I'm one of those HPC people, okay. and I've been using Ganglia. Actually, it's been longer than eight years. It goes way, way back. Um, do you have any information or do you have any experiences with you know, I, I really like Ganglia. I love the roll-up capabilities. Multicast is not a big deal for HPC people. In fact, that's how I like install operating systems on my compute nodes and things. Um, but the biggest problem is dealing with the RRDs, uh, especially you know once you start collecting performance data on systems that have 40 cores, say or more. Uh, the you you even on a small HPC cluster like a hundred nodes, you need a couple of machines alone just to handle the I.O. and you can do caching and everything. So, but do you have any experiences with, you know, at scale getting that information, just bypassing RD <laughs> entirely, just go right to Whisper, go right to something else? Yes. Um, all right. So yes, I've had this problem. Um, 
as many people have, I think. Uh, so I haven't, I haven't been able to work with ganglia since around 2012. Um, I, I changed jobs. Well, in 2012, I, I submitted a patch that um, enables GMetaD to emit carbon protocol. Um, so it's, it should still be possible to use the entire ganglia tool chain, um, GMetaD on the node, or GMonD on the nodes up to GMetaD centrally um, emitting to other GMonDs and have all of those GMonDs instead of writing to RD tool push out into, um, into carbon, which gets you wherever you want to go, gets you graphite, I mean, immediately, but it also gets you into things like Remin or HECA or, you know, any of those. Um, I would check the config file. It would be like at the bottom of gmond.conf. If you see something about carbon in there, um, then it's still in there. If not, I'm, I'm kind of curious. I, we should go and look. Ladies and gentlemen, cool. please uh, give a round of applause for David. Thanks, guys. Thank